For more than 40 years, in over 65 motion pictures and one Academy Award, no matter what the role, his performance was honest and true. Early on, a wholesome charm was his trademark. But in later years, with roles such as that of Pike Bishop, an outlaw in the violent film The Wild Bunch, he acquired a new, hard-bitten, rugged American persona. His name was William Holden, and in his own way, he fulfilled the promise of his first film. He was Hollywood's golden boy. Holden's Hollywood journey started in 1939 with his film debut in Golden Boy, a role that made him an instant star. A role the 21-year-old Holden had to work hard at. He had to get to the studio early each morning to have his hair darkened and curled. There were lessons in holding a violin and a bow. And he had to train intensively for the movie's fight scenes. But nothing lessened Holden's determination to prove himself. He would drop into my office during the filming of the picture. He had a half a day off. And we got to talking about how it was going. And all he could talk about was Barbara Stanwyck. He said she was the most wonderful. She was a saint, as far as he was concerned. The help she was to him. Lana, you're not kidding me, are you? You're like music to me, Lana. Rich, soft music that goes on in my head and heart for days and nights with a crazy tempo that seems to beat out. Beat out what, Joe? Your name, Lorna. Always Lorna, Lorna. Missy, he called her. And he was indeed her golden boy. William Franklin Beadle Jr. was born on April 17, 1918, in O'Fallon, Illinois a small rural town not far from St. Louis. He was the oldest of three sons. His parents were simple, nice people with a very strict upbringing. My grandfather was in the Olympics, I do believe, at one time. And so he decided that all his boys would have to do gymnastics like he did. My grandfather was a, a chemist, and he had his own, he had his own laboratory. Uh, it was a very modest situation, and I think probably coming out to Pasadena must have been quite a change. And so he was very strict with them because he wanted them to keep the values that he had instilled to in them. Mary Beadle, his mother, was a school marm, if you wish, and quite religious. But the family was very tied together. The love was there. The unity was there, and the boys didn't forget that. At South Pasadena High School, William Beadle excelled in gymnastics. He was an eager participant in the school's drama productions. He sang in the boys' glee club. And there were also other ways Holden got the attention he craved. He used to ride his motorcycle down the street standing on his hands on the handlebars, and that always gave everybody a little thrill. <laughs> to please his parents, who hoped he would enter his father's business, Holden took chemistry courses at Pasadena Junior College. Then a friend suggested he join the Pasadena Community Playhouse. In his very first play, he came to the attention of the head of new talent at Paramount Pictures. The minute he was under contract, we took him down to the publicity department and Terry said, we'll have to do something about your name. The telephone rang on Terry's desk. He picked the phone up, talked with whoever he was talking to and said, fine. Good to hear from you. Hung up, and all of a sudden he said, that's the next editor I used to work for, Bill Holden. He said, your name is Bill Holden from now on. Soon, young Holden was under contract to Columbia Pictures and starred in Golden Boy. Everything you want from breakfast until you turn out the light. A year later, Holden was loaned out to an independent producer, Saul Lesser. Holden would star in a film adaptation of Thornton Wilder's monumental play, Our Town. We want to smile on all those algebra problems. Good morning, everybody. Only four more hours to live. I didn't know what to expect with a William Holden I had never heard of before. And we were both very young. 
and starting. And I thought, oh my, I've done the play on Broadway for nine or ten months and got used to the young man who was doing it. And I wondered what it was going to be like. I mean, could you be? I am now. I always have been. So I guess this is a pretty important talk we've been having. Bill was extraordinary. So easy, so comfortable. Oh, it was a very special time in my life. Oh, well, he was the ideal, the ultimate boy next door. He was sort of a typical California, you know, good-looking, well-set-up young man. And uh, good-humored, bright. He fulfilled the appellation of Smiling Jim. And Smiling Jim roles were what Paramount and Columbia invariably offered Holden. I adored that young man. I think everybody who ever worked with Bill early on, every young lady, fell in love with him. Well, I did too. I just thought he was too much, till I found out he was engaged. Artis Ankerson was her name, which eventually became Brenda Marshall. And for a while there, she was going great guns. She and Bill met, they got married, and then one night, my wife and I went out to visit them. And the picture business disappeared that night. It never showed in their home. They never did talk about acting or anything. It was just a plain, ordinary suburban home. And uh, they were very much in love with each other. After a number of undistinguished movies, Holden's career was interrupted by World War II. William Holden became the first married star to enlist. He used his real name, William F. Beadle Jr. While he was in the service, Artis had their first son, Peter Westfield. Holden had already adopted Virginia, Artis's daughter, by her first marriage. Three years later, there would be a second son, Scott. With the war over, Holden returned to acting, still looking for deep and meaningful roles. It took until the 1950 film Sunset Boulevard for Holden to show he was not just the happy-go-lucky boy next door. Gloria Swanson, of course, was a brilliant stroke of genius on the part of Billy Wilder. Now, Bill Holden was a young man doing kind of light, romantic comedies. And this was a complete risk for Paramount to take a chance on this young actor. I had some trouble with my car, a flat tire. I pulled into your garage until I could get a spare. I thought this was an empty house. It is not. Get out. You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures, used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. But what happened was wonderful and fascinating. Bill emerged as a man of many colors. All I ask is for you to be a little patient and a little kind. Norma, I haven't done anything. Of course you haven't. I wouldn't let you. So now he was showing us that he could portray weakness and dishonesty, a little bit of depravity, Sadness, lostness. But something happened to him after Sunset Boulevard. He became an honest to goodness, real star. See? You didn't believe me. Now I suppose you don't think I have the courage. Oh, sure, if it would make a good scene. And something more important happened to him. He caught the attention of Billy Wilder, and he became a true friend of Billy's. And Billy saw that there was an actor here that had depth and many facets. For his performance in Sunset Boulevard, 
Holden garnered his first Academy Award nomination for Best Actor. In 1953, Billy Wilder revealed an entirely new side of William Holden when he directed him in Stalag 17. What's that crack supposed to mean? They're lying dead out there in the mud, and I'm trying to find out how come. I'll tell you how come. Because you, our security officer, said it'd be safe. And you, the barracks chief, gave him the green light. That's how come. What are you guys trying to prove, anyway? Cutting trap doors, digging... Listen, Seth, you listen to me! He could play someone who was a little antisocial or, or a scoundrel and get away with it because he kept playing parts of who we'd all like to be. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? No, I don't sprechen Sie Deutsch. Maybe just one word? Kaput? Because you're kaput, Price. Will you get this guy out of my hair so I can go? Go where? To the commandant's office and tell him where Dunbar is? Why, I'll kill you for that! For his performance in Stalag 17, Holden won the Academy Award. It was Hollywood's most significant acknowledgement, but the doubts remained. He always had a, a, a sense of insecurity in that there was, he'd wake up with, you know, with the realization that the whole thing was one big joke. And, that, you know, and he was not meant to be William Holden, a star, you know, an actor. A year later, at the age of 36, Holden appeared in another massive hit, The Country Girl. His co-star was Grace Kelly, who received an Academy Award for her performance in the film. That's what my ex-wife used to keep reminding me of, tearfully. She had a theory that behind every great man there was a great woman. She also was thoroughly convinced that she was great, and that all I needed to qualify was guidance on her part. There are certain films which affected him a great deal. Uh, films where there was actually something of value to be obtained that had something to do with reality, but mostly dealing with other actors uh, who had tremendous talent and had tremendous energy. Uh, he felt that, that would, it improved his performance. You can't believe that a woman is crazy out of her mind to live alone in one room by herself. Listen to me, listen to me. Why are you holding me? I said you're holding me. William Holden's growing public was now ready for a change of pace. It came the same year with Billy Wilder's Sabrina. Co-starring with Holden was Audrey Hepburn. Oh, Sabrina, Sabrina, where have you been all my life? Right over the garage. Right over my car. Right up in that tree. What a fool I was. What a crush I had on you. I'm convinced, someplace, that there are some people born with a gene that has magic for them as far as the screen's concerned. They click, they just make contact with that screen, and uh, Bill had the gene in spades. What's the matter, darling? You're not worried about us, are you? Because I'm not. So there'd be a big stink in the family, so who cares? David, I don't think I'm going to have dinner with Linus. I don't want to go out with him. <laughs> Why not? I want to be near you. Oh, I know how you feel, Sabrina. It must be an awful bore. But if Linus wants to take you out, let's be nice about it. It's very important. He's our only ally. Don't you see, Father will try to cut off my allowance and send me off to Larrabee, Copper, and Butte, Montana. And we don't want to go to Butte, Montana, do we? Hold me close, David. In the 1956 picnic, location shooting took place in Lawrence, Kansas. Later, William Holden would take pride in this film. Making it, however, was not an easy experience. I wanted to be older, and Bill wanted to be younger, because he felt so awkward and self-conscious about playing the part. He would say, I feel like such an idiot trying to be young again. In this movie, remember, it was still in the time of uh, heavy censorship, so I'll never forget that Bill Holden and Cliff Robertson had to shave their chests in the scene in the men's bathroom, and Bill kept saying, what am I doing for a living? What a ridiculous way to make a living. He hated doing the dance sequence at Picnic. Well, everybody hated it. I hated doing the dance sequence in Picnic. Bill was sure he couldn't dance. Kim Novak thought she couldn't dance. The result was history. It's probably one of the most provocative, sexy, 
uh, dance scenes uh, with two people fully clothed that you'll ever see. At the age of 39, Holden was at last a free agent and had reached the pinnacle of his career when Columbia's Harry Cohn managed to get him to star in The Bridge on the River Kwai by offering a deal unequaled in Hollywood. The movie was to become one of the greatest films of all time, winning Best Picture in 1957. An added attraction for Holden was the location, a new country to experience, Sri Lanka. Holden's mature, iconic male character was now on full display. The Bridge on the River Kwai, if you go back and look at that performance again, it is absolutely flawless, which is something that you can rarely say about an actor's performance. It is absolutely flawless. You never catch him acting, and every word he says sounds like the spoken truth. You're gonna leave me here. You stop, we stop. Well, go on without me. That's an order. You're in command now, Shears. I won't obey that order. You make me sick with your heroics. There's a stench of death about you. You carry it in your pack like the plague. Explosives and L pills, they go well together, don't they? And with you, it's just one thing or the other. Destroy a bridge or destroy yourself. This is just a game, this war. You and that Colonel Nicholson, you're two of a kind. Crazy with courage, for what? How to die like a gentleman, how to die by the rules, when the only important thing is how to live like a human being. We usually found that when he was particularly happy with a scene or, uh, or a story, it's usually because he could really relate to it. Uh, he could draw something out of his own experience and uh, apply it to, the, uh, to his character and probably pull it off with a lot more sincerity. By 1960, when the world of Susie Wong was released, William Holden's collection of travel color slides had grown. And his fascination with new people and new places was stronger than ever. If you want, I stay. I'll be your permanent girlfriend. Never go out with other boyfriends. Take good care of you. Susie, you're very attractive and I'm only human, but unfortunately there's no provision for anyone like you in my budget. With you is different. He became the quintessential American hero, humanized. Brought down to some level where, let's say unlike John Wayne who was bigger than life, Bill wasn't. He was someone who I think we felt could have been in our home, our father, our lover, our involved with us, so that he took this kind of heroic quality and made it accessible. Now I keep asking myself, what would I have done if I had been she? A frightened child, hungry, alone? Would I steal to survive? Would I? Just how far would I go in order to keep on living? A heavy drinker most of his life, Holden began a descent into alcoholism during the late 1950s. Then, in 1959, William Holden, the small town boy from Pasadena, picked up his family and moved to Europe. I think there were a number of considerations. First of all, uh, when you get a taste of the world and you start and you see that there's something else to the world than the United States, Hollywood, the American flag, and all these things, I think that uh, you begin to realize that there are other uh, lifestyles to be uh, appreciated and lived elsewhere. After William Holden had settled in Europe, he underwent one of the most profound experiences of his life. It occurred during a hunting trip to Kenya. When I saw my first elephant, uh, there was no way that I could accomplish that particular hunt for a trophy. I just couldn't do it. And it didn't take me long after I was here to realize that the handwriting was on the wall as far as wildlife in Africa was concerned. 
I think he realized that there was a great deal more in life uh, than just making movies. And um, he found it. He went out and looked for it. He went out and looked for things that made it interesting for him, that, uh, that he enjoyed, that he wanted to share with other people. And it also put a lot of life into, in, into him. It gave him another life. And I think that he needed that. Holden was now regularly spending time with other women, such as French actress Capucine. A poignant moment came when he witnessed the destructive alcoholic behavior portrayed in the Days of Wine and Roses. I ran uh, one of the early cuts of a film that I did called uh, Days of Wine and Roses. And uh, he came to see it with Capucine. And he was keeping company with Capucine at that time. And when it was all over, he looked at her and he said, was I really that bad? And she said, oh, worse. He said, I, I gave you that much trouble, did I? And she said, at least. Alcohol was a problem for him during his life, there's no doubt, and that's no secret for him. Everybody knows that. But I, I don't know if people do how, how much in his later life, how much he fought it and the things he did. He would put himself in clinics. He would, he would uh, do anything in his power to try and get this monkey off his back. While he was living in Europe in the 60s, Holden continued to star in pictures. None achieved the success of those he'd made a decade earlier. Then, in 1969, he accepted a role unlike any he'd ever played before. The film was Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch. It was William Holden's biggest hit in years. He had become a grizzled tough guy. Well, why don't you answer me, you damn yellow-livered trash? Now, Pike, you know I damn I don't well. know a damn thing, except I either lead this bunch or end it right now. What came out of him in Wild Bunch is nothing I don't think that you ever saw in any other performance that he ever did. The sheer toughness. I love the performance in Wild Bunch. I love the whole movie. In 1974, after extended separations, Holden and Artis ended their 30-year marriage. Holden now put more and more effort into improving the game preserve he had helped establish. Invariably at his side was actress Stephanie Powers. Kirinyaga, that's what it's called, not Kenya. The first time I saw it was in 1973 when Bill Holden first brought me out here. And created a monster in me because I fell in love deeply with this country and as I was already in love with the man it was a very happy set of circumstances. Africa held a mystical attraction for Bill. He seemed most alive when he talked about the country, the people. He said he felt something very special here, something very basic. He said Going to Africa makes me feel so alive. I'd heard various rumors about him. I'd heard he was very taciturn. I'd heard that he was very, uh, very private, very unresponsive, uh, did his work, went home, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'd heard that in the past there'd been a drinking problem. Um, and I didn't really know what to expect, except that I just knew that there was something so perfect about him for that part. It was a very important movie for him because it had been a long time since he'd acted. And as so often happens when actors have done a series of pictures where they don't know quite what, uh, what reason they did it for, um, they wonder if, they, if in a way the talent has dried up. Every time you come back from seeing somebody in your family, you come back in one of these morbid middle-aged movies. Every goddamn executive fired from a network in the last 20 years has written this dumb book about the great early years of television. I feel lousy about the pain that I've caused my wife and my kids. I feel guilty and conscience-stricken and all of those things that you think sentimental, but which my generation calls simple human decency. 
You're dealing with a man that has primal doubts, Diana. Well, what exactly is it you want me to do? I just want you to love me. William Holden received his third Academy Award nomination for his performance in Network. In 1981, William Holden played his final role. The picture was S.O.B., also starring Julie Andrews. The director, Blake Edwards. He had a kind of dashing quality about him and that sense of humor. Plus, you know, he was a very handsome, youthfully handsome man, even uh, in his 60s when he'd come riding up to the set on his great big motorcycle. <laughs> oh, 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 easy, gal, easy. <laughs> oh, you've got some fast moves for an old John Cully. You OK? <laughs> Terrific. You know, you are sexually notorious. Semi-fraudulent reputation, which I do everything I can to encourage. Why? Because it's the best way for an old man to compete in a young man's world. Hey. That charm was irreplaceable when that smile came, it uh, broke your heart as well as uh, enchanted you. Officials say the actor's body had been found by the building manager, who said he entered the apartment and found the body after a... On November 16, 1981, people around the world reacted with shock and disbelief. Actor, conservationist, father, and friend, he had been found dead in his Santa Monica apartment. It was reported he'd been drinking, that he died where he had fallen days earlier. The details were in the coroner's report. But this is not how he would be remembered. This is the way he will be remembered. In light and shadow, he traced what he was as an actor and as a man. A man we will never forget. He was and always will be Hollywood's golden boy.